I am uh, delighted to be chairing panel on um, political regime uh, with uh, four participants, Wasin Punton, Yulia Medievskaya, Ilya Solzhitsky, and Lizaveta dubinska Khushcha. Um, and uh, as I had mentioned, we will have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes per participant. Um, and uh, I will turn over to our first speaker, uh, Wasin Puton, the process of authoritarian consolidation in Belarus. Uh, there you go. In Belarus and Thailand, I'm sorry, the screen <laughs> went uh, uh, onto the presentation. Um, yes, hello everyone, is my screen up now and it is done. Um, so, and can you yes. hear me well? Okay, right. All set. Um, okay, I will move to... Um, hello everyone, I'm Vasin Pantong from Thammasat University, Thailand. I did my master at UCLC and it's good to be back. Today I'm going to present um, some preliminary findings from my work entitled The Process of Authoritarian Consolidation in Belarus and Thailand, Institutional and Interpretive Manipulation. Um, to begin with, Belarus has been called the last dictator in Europe, while Thailand has seen two successful military coups in less than a decade, one in September 2006 and the other in May 2014. The two countries represent authoritarian authoritarianism on a spectrum. Comparing the two regimes is expected to improve our understanding about the political dynamics in authoritarian regimes. Um, this presentation thus aims to explain the dynamics of authoritarian consol consolidation, which has received increasing interest among comparative politics scholars. Um, Specifically, I examined the process of authoritarian consolidation in Belarus under Lukashenko regime and Thailand under Prayut regime from a comparative perspective, drawing on the empirical evidence from the 2020 presidential election in Belarus and the 2019 general elections in Thailand. I consider both elections part of the authoritarian consolidation attempts um, the political dynamics during the election period in both um, autocracies have shown how the authoritarian, authoritarian rulers orchestrate nominally democratic politics institutionally and discursively to ensure their uh, political survival. Um, regarding the plan of presentation, I will start with describing the empirical context, then justify rationals of comparison, then I will talk about the design of the study and highlight the contributions to authoritarian consolidation literature. Um, then I will proceed to the discussion of literature and lay out how I develop an analytical perspective. And finally, I will present the preliminary findings. Um, let's start with the empirical context, and I will also um, use this opportunity to, to justify the comparability between the two cases. Um, first, I map out the recent political developments in both countries and will establish the comparative frames that will be applied in both cases systematically. The Lukashenko regime is characterized by adaptive authoritarianism, while the Prayut regime is conceptualized as military-guided semi-authoritarianism. Despite historical and contextual differences, as well as different political system, um, Belarus is a presidential republic while Thailand is a um, par parliamentary system. Both regimes in fact show strong traits of authoritarian consolidation in the sense that democratic traits in already authoritarian situations further wane. Otherwise stated, the authoritarian elites have embedded their ruling project in the political system through institutional manipulation coupled with a legitimation strategy to enhance their discursive power through a plethora of communication channels. Such manipulative practices are adjusted according to the changing contexts along 
this line of argument, I conceptualize authoritarian consolidation as a dynamic process rather than a completed and static political project. This means one would anticipate a series of adjustment and upgrade of manipulative strategies in response to the emerging challenges. Next, I would like to establish the rationals for comparison um, basically, comparative analysis helps to contrast the context and enable us to identify the critical variables that explain the outcome in different um, contexts, in this case, Belarus and Thailand. Um, in relation to empirical reality, Belarus under the Lukashenko regime and Thailand under the Prayut regime share similar features that illustrate the practices of institutional manipulation in both countries, and free, not free and unfair, general elections were organized under the dem democratic facade to ensure that the incumbents are not changed. This is the surface level. Upon closer inspection to a deeper level as encouraged by political communication literature, Another key factor that enables authoritarian durability is regime legitimation. The case of Belarus shows the regime's tight control of media, while in Thailand, press freedom has been deteriorating under the Prayut government, according to Freedom House, um, the recent report. It is obvious that both regimes are trying to suppress critical voices. However, less is known about their attempt to exercise discursive manipulation to justify their rule through non-repressive means, such as image curation and appealing narrative. So my analysis of regime legitimation particularly contributes to the emerging body of knowledge that deals with political communication in authoritarian settings. Um, I grant that unique local context is not negligible. It is crucial to investigate the extra regime pressures that might play out and shape the ways in which authoritarian rulers manipulate democratic-like politics. In the case of Belarus, the Russian factor is influential in the survival of the um, incumbent. In the case of Thailand, the military monarchy nexus remains a crucial determinant in influencing the course of Thai politics. These factors are seen as contextual pressures to the authoritarian regime, which can be varied according to the specific historical manifestations and normative settings, such as the perceived national core values. Uh, these differences do not preclude both cases from a meaningful comparison because such factors do not sufficiently determine the political outcome in each of the authoritarian regime under study. Hence, this assumption opens up an opportunity to look at other key features that sustain the authoritarian regime and how they might interact with those um, contextual imperatives. In particular, those contextual factors can be seen as extra regime political forces um, with which the authoritarian regime can form a political alliance to legitimize its existence. Um, based on my literature review, I, de I develop an analytical framework by combining insights from two sets of literature to account for both institutional and discursive manipulation that influence the dynamics of authoritarian consolidation in Belarus and Thailand. One is the literature concerning the inner workings of authoritarian machinery that highlights the manipulation of nominally democratic institutions to commandeer authoritarian in disguise politics. The other is a strand of literature that studies political communication in authoritarianism. It supplements the institutional analysis by accentuating another layer of manipulative strategy that addresses the ways in which authoritarian regimes manufacture political legitimacy through discourses to pro prolong um, the, the rule. Um, and to warrant a systematic comparison, I further refine the frame of comparison by breaking it into subcategories um, as shown on the screen. In terms of research design, Data sources are derived from the official documents, laws, regulations, speeches, newspapers, 
as I also take stock of the practices of discursive manipulation, I specific, um, a specific criterion is additionally set to ensure a rigorous data analysis. Um, the included documentary data need to demonstrate the ways in which the authoritarian regimes articulate leadership image and legitimacy discourses to remain in power. I also use NVivo software to aid my analysis of documentary data. Now let's proceed to the preliminary findings. In terms of discursive manipulation, President Lukashenko is presented as a strong man whose committed lifelong mission is to make safe the nation he has built and legitimacy discourse being articulated um, before and after the election can be encapsulated as protecting Belarus against the West. In the case of Thailand leadership image cultivation constructs Prime Minister Prayut um, who was the hunter leader as the good man who leads the country with a moral compass unlike corrupted politicians. The legitimacy discourse in the case of Thailand um, therefore highlights national unity underpinned by Thainess, which is um, uh, vaguely defined but frequently used by the regime to attract the elitist and tradition traditionalist forces in the society. In terms of institutional manipulation, there are four key comparative dimensions. The first is the exploitation of administrative resources. In Belarus, the government owns roughly 80% of the of all um, industry and many workers equate Lukashenko with job security. In Thailand, the junta government uses the Pracharat scheme to build its political network and use uses this particular term as the name of the party created for the junta to stay in power under a democratic facade. As I draw on the empirical evidence from the recent elections in both regimes, the exploitation of administrative resources should be seen as a part of the wider institutional manipulation efforts. The second is electoral engineering. In Belarus, with vote rigging and direct interference of the election results, there are merely, merely virtual presidential election stage as a ritual. In Thailand, multi-party competition did happen, but was staged under the rules that favored the incumbent. There, these were electoral, uh, there were electoral malpractices. For instance, the new 2017 constitution um, deploy a complex voting system combined with interim provisions that allowed the appointed Senate to share in selecting the prime minister. And this creates a favorable environment for the coup cool leaders to compete in a democratic-like politics. The vote counting system was also changed. Opposition parties have questioned the results saying that rules were changed after the vote to give an advantage to smaller parties which most of them later support the Prayut regime. The third dimension is orchestration of electoral competition. In Belarus, presidential election is known to be populated by fake candidates. This means there is no real competition. Um, in Thailand, as I said, the military successor uh, party, the Palang Pracharat party was created as a vehicle um, to allow the junta members to continue in office beyond the election. As Thailand has installed the par parliamentary system, the key to political control lies at the legislature. The Prayut regime thus designs a manageable parliament that will help implement its will. Um, the fourth dimension is about lawfare and political um, incarceration. In Belarus, potential candidates are harassed and forced to flee the country. In Thailand, an important opposition party, the Thai Raksa Chad, was dissolved by the election commission during the campaign on highly dubious legal grounds. The election commissioners were picked by the junta, similar to the case of Belarus in which um, election commissioner is also um, handpicked by the president. Based on these results, I propose the following um, tentative conclusions. Um, first, manipulation of the nominally democratic institutions and legitimacy discourses, which I formulate as the two-pronged strategy of manipulation in Belarus and Thailand are the political guile, 
that entails deepened authorization. However, recent elections and the ensuing mass disillusionment show the limitations of such a strategy. So the regimes resort to political repression. Um, what we also see is that the embattled rulers endurance is also conditional upon the extra regime um, critical factors. In the case of Belarus, it's the Russian factor, and in the case of Thailand, it's the monarchy military nexus. And finally, um, the political development in both, in both countries show that, um, that we might be able to start seeing the signal that the incumbents are looking for the exit strategy. Um, one of them is to put the pardon clause in the constitution. And of course, um, the incumbent needs to look for um, the successor. Um, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Wesson. Uh, and I apologize for not introducing you properly. So I just want to take one second to do so. Uh, so uh, Wesson is a lecturer at Tomasat University in Bangkok. He earned uh, a master's from the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of College London, as well as a second master from the University of Tartu, Estonia. And his research interests are on cybercrime against women and children and the spread of fake news in social media. Thank you again. Wasn't. And now I will turn to Yulia Medvedevskaya. Yulia Medvedevskaya is a researcher at the Center for IT and IP Law at the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, she has worked on sanctions, cybersecurity, and common policy and security policy. And her presentation at the conference today will be of the project entitled Rest Restrictive Measures Against Belarus, Are EU Sanctions Really Targeted, Temporary, and Preventive? Thanks, Yulia, and take it away. We cannot hear you just yet. Yes, yes. good afternoon, everyone. I'll I try once again. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present our research with my fantastic author, Celia Chalet from the College of Europe. And uh, uh, bear with me, I think I cannot um i cannot change my slides you might want to reshare them i think there's something that happens when you click full screen on zoom maybe that's part of the problem so see if you could share them again well yeah now i can share them yeah thank you very much um so uh in the past months, we've heard quite a lot about EU sanctions uh, on, on Belarus. And uh, uh, EU sanctions on Belarus is actually one of the most interesting sanctions food box because it's, uh, um, it's one of the oldest sanctions uh, frameworks. And also it's also one of the broadest sanctions framework because it includes uh, a wide range of sanctions measures. And in this specific research, we would like to focus on three main attributes of EU restrictive measures on the targeted character, on their temporary and reverse, reversible uh, nature, and also on their preventive and non-punitive character. Uh, character. Uh, by targeted, of course, I, I think uh, all of us understand that we mean that uh, sanctions are not supposed to have unintended consequences for, for broader population. By temporary and reversi reversible measures, we mean that sanctions are not meant uh, to last forever, that they shall be limited in time. And by preventive nature of sanctions and their non-punitive uh, character, we mean that sanctions are not construed as uh, penalties and uh, they must serve as an incentive in order to change a specific behavior. But when we were observing EU sanctions in Belarus, we actually came to the conclusion that those three attributes of EU sanctions, which we found in most of the EU official documents, that they do not really correspond to reality. And uh, for this reason, we decided to make an exploratory and also a comparative analysis of different EU official documents, statements uh, on EU sanctions in Belarus, also to do case law analysis in order to uh, question whether those sanctions are really targeted as announced, whether they're really temporary, and whether they're really preventive. And here, Belarus will serve as a case study. 
So first of all, when we speak about sanctions, and I think in the past months we've heard uh, uh, almost uh, all the time this word uh, targeted uh, restrictive measures. Uh, but we claim that this concept, it's a blurry concept. Uh, what do we mean exactly when we speak about targeted restrictive measures? When we speak about, uh, for instance, a ban on Belavia, are we still speaking about targeted restrictive measures or whether these are broader measures, which would also have an impact uh, on, on, the, on the population of, uh, of Belarus and not only on, on the um, Lukashenko's regime. And uh, if we look at different uh, definitions of uh, restrictive measures at the UN level, we can notice that there are also different approaches. There is one approach which considers that sanctions are targeted only if, a ta if they target elites of the country and do not affect the population. There is a different region, which is a broader region of this targeted character. And in this broader region, uh, targeted sanctions can also include selective bans. In the European Union, if we look at the Council conclusions on sanctions, we will notice that uh, sanctions are considered targeted only if they target those responsible for the policies or actions and those benefiting from and supporting such policies and actions. So basically, the European Union, when, when it speaks about uh, targeted sanctions, it means to reduce any adverse humanitarian effect uh, for persons which are not uh, targeted. Because they learned this uh, lesson from the past with the case of Iraq, when the European Union and the United Nations were also uh, reproached with uh, 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 qu quite uh, hard humanitarian consequences of those broad uh, uh, economic sanctions, and they decided to move to this targeted character of sanctions. However, when we look at uh, uh, the EU practice, what, what is stated in paper is one thing, but when we look how it's really applied, specifically in the case of Belarus, we notice that in the past years there is a tremendous broadening of EU restrictive measures on Belarus. And this broadening is done in two different ways. So one way, it's the broadening of listing criteria. And when I speak about listing criteria, I mean reasons why someone is included on the sanctions list. And uh, we also think that this, is, th this might be this broadening, might be a deliberate solution. Uh, because of course, more targeted sanctions mean that there is a limited impact and more broader, the broader the sanctions, they're uh, more influential also those sanctions will be. And another trend that we noticed is that there is a shift from targeted to sectoral sanctions. And sometimes the European Union tends to present the, those sectoral sanctions as if they were also targeted sanctions. Because technically, technically speaking, if uh, those uh, uh, sectoral sanctions, if they are included in the listing criteria, they can also fall under the example of targeted sanctions. And when we were studying those EU Council conclusions, we found a broad range of measures, like for instance, um, freezing of funds, economic resources, restrictions on admission, arms embargo, ex export restrictions, import restrictions, all flight bans, all of those, they were presented as uh, targeted uh, sanctions. But uh, I think everyone would, would agree that those measures, they are considerably broader than just uh, sanctions on some, uh, some uh, representative, for instance, of, of the Belarusian government. So now I will go a little bit deeper into the broadening of listing criteria, uh, because that's one of the techniques which is being used by the Council with respect to Belarus. And the broadening of listing criteria allows to uh, target a, a larger scope uh, of, of persons uh, and also enlarges the scope of restrictive measures. And uh, it's also a technique which can be used in order to um, make it easier for the European Union, for the Council to substantiate uh, those restrictive measures with evidence. Because we know from the past uh, that the European, that, the, uh, that some uh, sanctions were challenged by, uh, uh, for instance, Belarusian businessmen, Belarusian journalists in front of the Court of Justice. Then another thing that we, uh, yeah, if I speak about the broadening of uh, listing criteria, I would like to go uh, to my next slide just to give an example of how it was done. For instance, for restrictive measures in 2011, 2012, uh, listing criteria were updated and they included uh, not only, for instance, those who were responsible for 
uh, serious violations of human rights, but also those associated with them. And legally speaking, when we mention someone uh, who is associated, it's quite difficult to prove how can we know who is associated like from, from a legal perspective, what does this mean exactly? How are we going to establish this link and how far can the EU go? And from this point of view, we looked at uh, the case law of the Court of Justice in order to understand what can be mean by this association. And we looked at the opinion of the Advocate General Mangozi, who actually he uh, singled out three concentric circles of people who can be connected to, to a specific political uh, regime. The first circle is, of course, the rulers themselves, and those are the first ones to target. Then there is the second circle, persons who are associated directly or indirectly with the rulers. And then there is the third circle, family members of persons who benefit from the regime. And with respect to Belarus, there were uh, also questions whether the European Union can target family members. But at the end of the day, it's not possible from a legal perspective because uh, uh, this link is uh, too, it's too far away. Those persons, they cannot be uh, sanctioned because the European Union uh, shall, uh, uh, shall respect the rule of law and uh, shall not um, sacrifice uh, the, the uh, fundamental rights of sanctioned individuals uh, for the sake of, uh, of the effectiveness of, of restrictive measures. And if I go back to my, to my slide on the broadening of listing criteria, I can notice that um, uh, for sanctions in, in 2020, uh, listing criteria were also significantly updated uh, in order to include, uh, for instance, persons who are uh, participating in the um, and, and contributing to uh, the activities of the Belarusian government in the uh, illegal crossing of, uh, of the external borders of the, of the European Union. Then another way how the European Union uh, broadens its sanctions is, of course, this shift from targeted to sectoral sanctions. And it's, of course, it's done in order to gradually increase pressure on the Belarusian authorities. Uh, and in most of the cases, we notice that this is done uh, when uh, the EU's own security is at stake. We compared EU, um, uh, EU sanctions on Belarus with EU sanctions on Russia, and we noticed, for instance, that the same was uh, observed with respect to the downing of Malaysian Airlines flight uh, and uh, when there was a threat to the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Again, the European Union was adopting uh, sectoral sanctions in order, of course, to make sure that the impact of those sanctions is more significant for the target. Then there is another uh, attribute of restrictive measures is that they're temporary and reversible. And in uh, both in the Council guidelines and also in uh, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, both of them, they say that sanctions must be reviewed from time to time. For Belarus sanctions, it's uh, every six months. And uh, those sanctions shall be uh, uh, lifted once their objectives are met. And the Court of Justice also stipulates that uh, restrictive measures are temporary and precautionary measures. Uh, and they must be limited in time. But if we look at restrictive measures on Belarus, we notice that, first of all, there is no expiration day. It's unclear how to assess that their objectives were achieved. It's also uh, objective of EU sanctions on Belarus are not always straightforward and clear cut. And basically it means that the council can virtually review uh, san renew sanctions uh, uh, all the time, uh, infinitely on, on Belarus, if member states agree and there is a consensus uh, in, in the council. So this proves that this temporary character of EU restrictive measures on Belarus, it's a, it, it's a myth. Uh, EU sanctions on Belarus, they were already in place First, they were adopted in uh, 1997, but then there were new restrictive measures under common foreign and security policy framework since 2004. And those sanctions, they were multiple times uh, suspended and then reintroduced, like partial suspension in 2008. Uh, uh, then again, reintroduced in 2011. Then some measures uh, were selectively suspended first in 2015 and then selectively listed in 2016, uh, but still arms embargo and the listing of uh, four members of the Lukashenko Security Service, uh, those who were suspected of the involvement in disappearance of uh, some political figures, those sanctions were never suspended. 
And Belarus is not an isolated case. So there are multiple, there are still examples of, of sanctions that uh, all last uh, since the introduction for many years, like sanctions uh, against uh, Taliban in Afghanistan, against Tunisia, Russia. So we calculated that the average duration of, of sanctions for a, a listed uh, person or entity, it's around 10 years. And we can see that uh, Belarus uh, sanctions uh, framework, it's one of the oldest uh, in the European Union. And the question is uh, what actually the European Union wants to achieve by, uh, by, by uh, keeping those persons on sanctions list for so, so long, if it does not bring any results at the end. And then another question is whether those measures are really reversible, because that's also something which is stipulated by the Court of Justice, and it might be linked to the nature of restrictive measures, uh, notably to asset freezes, because asset freezes means that uh, targeted individual does not, or entity, they do not lose their economic resources, and they can be fully retrieved uh, when the asset freeze comes to an end. Uh, however, uh, we would claim that this is different in practice because still asset freezes, both for individuals and both for uh, targeted entities, might have long lasting effect, effects. Uh, and um, both uh, also sexual uh, economic sanctions, they would also have uh, quite important long lasting, lasting effects on the country's society as a whole. And we could also notice this even from the EU sanctions framework on Russia, for instance, Nesheka Bank, who was prohibited from having access to EU financial markets. And for this reason, uh, the bank could not realize some of societal projects. So it has some uh, larger, broader societal implications. Uh, and for this reason, we do claim that EU restrictive measures are not really reversible because they will still have reputational damage for Belarus, economical losses, disruption of supply channels, uh, also difficulty to recover the lost markets. Um, and some of the scholars already say that the significant impact of restrictive measures is both undeniable uh, and irreversible. And some other scholars call sanctions as draconian measures, unlimited as to time and quantum, and also de with devastating consequences. And then another question is, are you sanctions on Belarus, are they really preventive? And if we look at this word preventive in Oxford dictionary, preventive means that it's intended to try to stop something, something from happening. If we look at United Nations sanctions, we also come to the conclusion that uh, the United Nations, they um, consider those sanctions are not as punitive measures, uh, which can be triggered uh, in response to a breach of an international obligations, but um, as a measure in order to contribute to peace, um, to, to, the, to the threat to, to, to peace. So those measures in the United Nations framework, they are not meant to be uh, uh, punitive. And the same applies to the European Union, where the Court of Justice on multiple occasions stated that sanctions are not punitive, but preventive. Uh, however, Still, there is some disagreement, and in our research or in our analysis of EU sanctions on Belarus, we notice that uh, sanctions take more and more a punitive character, not really preventive, because they do not, on, on most of the occasions, they do not fulfill their signaling potential, and they do not prevent uh, something from happening, but the EU, in most of the cases, responds to the misconduct or to, to, to a misbehavior. Uh, and it can be also compared, for instance, that uh, sanctions against those who are involved in torture, uh, to some extent, can be compared to universal jurisdiction. So it's another mean to punish. It's a, like kind of transversal, tra transnational form of punishment for violations of human rights uh, in, in Belarus. So from this respect, we also put into question this preventive character of EU sanctions and would claim that EU sanctions policy becomes more and more punitive rather than preventive. And our main conclusions is that restrictive measures against Belarus, it's one of the examples of this increasing gap between what sanctions are on paper and how they look uh, in reality and what they achieve in reality. And also one, another important thing to notice is that restrictive measures are losing now their exceptional nature because they're being adopted more and more often. And uh, this leads to the fact that most probably they lose their ability to trigger a change of behavior from the country or from the person's concern. And also we can observe this vicious circle of sanctions followed by counter sanctions 
which leads to even more punitive dynamic of uh, those restrictive measures. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Yulia. Uh, and now I would like to welcome our next speaker, Ilya Solzhitsky who will, uh, Ilya is based at the University of Greifswald uh, and European Humanities University. He holds a PhD in sociology uh, from Belarus uh, University. And his research focus is in computational social science and digital sociology with an interest in memory studies and cultural sociology. Uh, Ilya, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I can't use presentation because we need to stop previous yes uh, so maybe uh, Yulia can you stop sharing yes and mm -hmm. now Elia can uh, okay great um, and you my have presentation yeah my presentation is called the evolution of lies uh, and uh, it will be about more about uh, different strategies and different methods of uh, semantic methods, especially in semantic features of uh, Belarusian state propaganda uh, in two major uh, propaganda channels. In Belarus, uh, the official one is uh, uh, digital media SB, Belarus Sivodnya. And the second one is uh, Telegram channel Jolte Sliwe, very aggressive and very interesting from the point of uh, from the analytical point of, point of view channel. Uh, so uh, when we are talking about uh, propaganda in Belarus, uh, we see that these propaganda methods uh, became more sophisticated after the August uh, 2020s. Uh, uh, on this slide, we see uh, our propagandist uh, Marzaluk uh, talking about uh, Pierre Rudling's works uh, on, genocide, on genocide and uh, on Holocaust of Belarusian people. Uh, to <clears throat> uh, and uh, he, try, he tried to use these works to um, uh, find some foundations for new memorial law in Belarus, for, for example, and. Uh, and these features of Belarusian propaganda uh, that tries to um, use some uh, from one hand liberal discourse, uh, if uh, we are talking about migration crisis, uh, from the other hand, tries to use uh, Western intellectuals to uh, find some solutions and find some foundations, foundations to uh, their policy. Uh, it is uh, be become it becomes obvious that uh, the Russian propaganda became more sophisticated, uh, more pro-Russian, and uh, uh, it starts is starting to use um, Russian propaganda style. Uh, when we are talking about uh, recent uh, research in uh, Propaganda studies in Belarus. Uh, we see that there are a lot of uh, different materials, uh, and we have two centers that an analyze propaganda in Belarus: Media IQ materials and Press Club Belarus materials. Uh, Me Media IQ uh, shows very very interesting materials about Belarusian propaganda, about relating the journalistic measures and journalistic, uh, journalistic ethics uh, in Belarusian media. Uh, also, we see the academic works that, uh, but these academic works, uh, they focused more on 2020s Belarusian propaganda during the elections, for example, uh, and uh, a, a short time after the elections. And uh, when we try to understand uh, what to do with propaganda and how to analyze propaganda now, uh, it is not much more, not, not, not very much uh, uh, papers and not very much um, research in this field. Uh, but still, uh, what uh, do we know about uh, propaganda in Belarus already? We see that uh, from the one hand, uh, uh, we see Russia as an active actor of state propaganda, and uh, it is obvious after the it became so obvious after the 
um, elections after the August uh, 2020s, uh, the ambivalent status of Belar Belarusian and Russian relations in the official media before and after the election, and as I already mentioned in the question um, to Alex, that uh, during the election campaign uh, from Russia's side, there was anti anti regime propaganda propaganda not very uh, strong, not very aggressive, but still. Uh, uh, propaganda starts to use new technologies, uh, digital media, bots, fake news, and it is also from uh, Russia-style propaganda, Russian uh, Russian infrastructure, propaganda, pr propaganda infrastructure. Uh, so we have a strong pro-Russian agenda and uh, Russian-style propaganda, more aggressive, more emotional. Uh, more diversive, uh, and uh, it tries to catch many different um, social groups. Uh, and uh, there is a myth of popular unity, a myth of national unity in Belarusian propaganda, a consensus between uh, the population, how it's called in our uh, our propaganda rhetorics, like uh, населения, uh, and the authorities on all issues of the country's development. Uh, strong and anti-Western agenda, liberal rhetorics, uh, uh, tr propaganda tries to use liberal rhetorics to criticize the West from the point of violating human rights, for example, in Poland, uh, violating the rights of migrants or refugees uh, in the Belarusian Poland border. Uh, Strong division into insiders and outsiders, uh, uh, and active anti Polish rhetoric. It is uh, that we already know about this propaganda. And what we don't know, uh, it's more connected with the propaganda like a discourse, it's more connected like with uh, structures of propaganda, uh, Latin structures of propaganda. Uh, some object objective features, statistical fe features of propaganda. Uh, <clears throat> and different semantic uh, methods that propaganda use. I will call it propaganda toolbox. Uh, so uh, I try to understand uh, these deep structures of propaganda discourse in Belarus. Uh, and uh, I use uh, machine learning analytics uh, to understand uh, these propaganda structures in the two major propaganda media. Uh, Zolte uh, Sliwe. There are 22,000 posts from August uh, to uh, February 2022. And uh, SB, Soviet Belarus, Belarus, Sivodny, 82,000 articles from uh, uh, August, uh, from August to till February 2022. Uh, I will start from Zolte Sliwe because Zolte Sliwe is uh, the main aggressive. Uh, propaganda channel in Belarus, uh, and this uh, this propaganda is very uh, straightforward, uh, very uh, very emotional, and uh, a lot of different features of Belarusian propaganda can be understood with the help of Zolte Sliwe. Uh, we see this picture uh, on the main channel. I uh, tried also uh, read read them not only with techniques of machine learning but like a, like a person like a reader and it was very hard uh, because uh, it, was, it is very um, very strong propaganda very very aggressive a lot of emotions a lot of uh, a lot of controversial topics uh, in it and i see that it can it can uh, have uh, this effect uh, so I will try to use uh, uh, what to work models uh, to understand what similarity uh, between different topics of propaganda. Uh, here on the um, pictures, we will see most similar and most uh, in similar words uh, with comparing with each other. And uh, I can, uh, I can uh, say more broadly about these propaganda features. Uh, first of uh, this feature is um, strong marginalization of the opposition. And we already know about it, so that uh, um, governments that power, uh, that uh, regime uh, tries to marginalize the opposition. But uh, in this case, we see how 
uh, it works. For example, uh, here we see the keywords Magar, fighter. Uh, Jolte Sliver don't use, don't really uh, of don't really often use uh, words opposition. It's uh, they use words Magar uh, because they want to divide the idea of opposition, like pro-government opposition, for example, from the uh, from uh, revolutional opposition, and they called uh, everybody's Magars, Zmagari, uh, and it, it is interesting that we have a here very very aggressive discourse about Zmagars. Uh, uh, about uh, Belarusian opposition. Uh, we have here, um, for example, freak, uh, pedophile, uh, pedophile, uh, uh, gubop, it's our, it's a reference to gubopic, to our police, uh, um, uh, police organization, uh, which is leads like to uh, find, to undercover, uh, to, to find some some people to cage them and to uh, get them into the prison uh, from one hand. And from the other hand, uh, it is more most opposite what's for Zmaga is uh, what's that's connected with European, European uh, uh, with Union, <laughs> European Union. Why it is interesting? Because uh, uh, this propaganda channel tries not only to marginalize, uh, to make uh, opposition and uh, to not turn opposition into marginals, but uh, this propaganda tries to divide the European support of our opposition uh, in, in the field of discourse. And we see that uh, this, uh, this international agenda it's, it's strongly divided with, uh, with our opposition, Belarusian opposition. Jolte mm. Sliwe, propaganda in Jolte Sliwe tries to make this, this field of international connections uh, make more autonom autonomous and uh, tries to legalize uh, Lukashenko, <laughs> legalize, yeah, uh, tries to um, make Lukashenko more. Um, more legitimate uh, ruler uh, because he uh, he can um, make these interactions with uh, European Union. Uh, the second uh, the second feature of uh, propaganda discourse is uh, semantic autonomy of the referendum, and we see that uh, topics about constitution. Uh, Propaganda tries to divide topics of consti uh, about constitution from uh, aggressive emotional words. Uh, for example, we see here them, and they are uh, also connected with different um, opposition discourses. Uh, also, uh, we see in the case of refugee crisis, propaganda tries to <laughs> divide refugee crisis from uh, oppositional crisis, from political crisis. And we as analytics, we know that uh, political crisis in uh, Belarus and refugee crisis is connected, by, but, uh, but uh, um, propaganda tries to disconnect this. Uh, it tries to make um, this refugee crisis, uh, border crisis, uh, make more autonomous from, uh, from uh, inner policy with opposition. Uh, and, this is also the one of the most important one of the most important method of um, organization by opposition because opposition uh, in uh, in propaganda discourse opposition lose uh, connections with every situation in Belarus with refugee crisis with international politics with um, with uh, government politics and so on. Uh, also, we see the uh, uh, attempts to uh, get Lukashenko more legitimacy with uh, international relations, relationships, and we see that, for example, not only Vladimir Putin or Russia or Glava Gosudarstva is uh, more similar words to Lukashenko, but also Angela Merkel, for example. Uh, and this is also the one of the <clears throat> important propaganda methods. Uh, Propaganda tries to include Lukashenko into the inter international uh, agenda. 
it tries to show uh, to show that uh, Lukashenko uh, can make dialogue with Angela Merkel, for example, and to with uh, some European states. Uh, and also every uh, every attempt of uh, those in opposition to make connections with, for example, European uh, European Union, uh, it's uh, not, not very uh, not very. Uh, the propaganda don't like this topic, <laughs> if I say in simple words. So, uh, for example, we see that opposition, ex uh, propaganda tries to exclude the opposition from the dialogue. Even if we see the more similar words to what di to, to keywords dialogue, we will see that uh, uh, it is a lot about uh, <laughs> constructive dialogue, so called constructive dialogue. Uh, about discussion, about uh, about some attempts att att attempts to discussion, but we see from the other hand uh, that the the words with, uh, which connected with opposition in this channel uh, is very uh, divided from dialogue. And uh, I, I, I think that if we uh, try to understand uh, future Belarusian policy. Uh, with the help of Belarusian propaganda, we will see that there is uh, there will be no dialogue uh, because uh, opposition in the um, in the this point of view it's like enemy enemy that uh, needs to be excluded from the symbolical space. Uh, so, yeah, you have about two minutes, Max. Yeah, yeah, okay, I I I, I will end soon. Uh, Another feature is excluding the opposition from the image of the nation. Uh, for example, uh, if Jolte Sliwe writes about nation, it's, uh, they write about, um, from the one hand, they write about государственность, uh, nice, like uh, governments, about governance, about territory, about masculinity, uh, about uh, uh, un unity and so on from the one hand, from the other hand about uh, fascism and um, suffering of Belarusian people in the age of, uh, in the time of uh, Second World War and Great Patriotic War. But from the other hand, we see that uh, uh, this discourse with, which is connected with Belarusian opposition because uh, it's about uh, the catching of Belarusian opposition, prisoning of Belarusian opposition. It's also di strongly divided uh, from the discourse of nation. So uh, we we see that uh, so-called Zmagari, they uh, like a symbolic field in itself. It's uh, in Belarusian propaganda, uh, in Zolte Sliwe, for example, Belarusian opposition lose every connections with everything, with uh, every part of Belarusian reality. And uh, the last, uh, the last interesting thing it's about Belarus and Belarus, uh, two two image, images of nation, and we have Belarus, uh, what similar was to Belarus. They uh, propaganda use Belarus only with uh, some. Um, um, I, I think I, I can say that it's some uh, insult of Belarusian language. They use it like a joke. For example, they use some Belarusian words, and uh, after that, they make uh, this mark Belarus. Uh, and if you're talking about Belarus, uh, it's about uh, nation, it's about people, uh, it's about, uh, you'll see here, Russian, so Russian words, like uh, yeah, like people who live with you in your country, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Polish guy and uh, uh, occupant genocide. It's also about uh, discourse of Second World War and Great Patriotic War in 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 this situation. Uh, and we see the new uh, as a result. We see a new round of marginalization. Uh, so-called uh, so-called mold. Yeah, you have to finish up. So. Yep, I will finish on this mold, uh, and we see that there is a, a new wave of hate speech uh, uh, in the discourse of Belarusian propaganda, um, in the discourse of opposition, and we see the keywords, the most similar words to 
uh, what place to what what placing uh, which uh, re reference to our Belarusian opposition thank you very much thank you so much Ilya so I now want to open this up uh, to questions so to ask a question please raise your hand in the um in the participants window uh and uh, you should also feel free to enter questions in the chat but i will call on you to ask them yourself and i already see uh yarek um Yarek, please thank you very much very interesting fascinating presentations i have a, a question for yulia and i was wondering whether you are thinking of exploring uh, the sanction narratives as uh, they are used in the political process in Belarus, <clears throat> because very often I see that sanctions are blamed for everything or praised for everything what is happening in Belarus. For example, today they released uh, the Swiss uh, citizen from the Belarusian prison, and some people say, oh yes, it's a result of sanctions. And other people say, oh, it's a result of Switzerland recognizing well, uh, Lukashenko as the president of Belarus because they gave him well, uh, like an ambassador that was accredited to Belarus just recently. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on that? Um, and I appreciate there will be many more questions. So Wolle, feel free to take a few more. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so there's also, uh, so I'll take two more questions uh, and then I'll give participants time to respond and then I will go back to questions. So, uh, Stefan. Hi, uh, thank you for very enlightening uh, talks. I'm just interested, you know, with my own research and authoritarian learning um, from what Wasin and Ilya said. Um, so in terms of, for Wasin, thank you for a fantastic talk. But just wondering whether there's any connection between the Belarusian and Thai regimes, whether they actually do talk to each other and these sort of things, and you know, that, well, what you know about that. Uh, and in regards to Ilya, um, you said that the propaganda was effective. I'm just wondering, obviously measuring effectiveness is always hard, but how effective was the propaganda? And two, I know that during the protests in 2020, Russia sent a lot of people in to help with the media. How much of this has actually been learning from what the Russians have done in the past? Um, that's, yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of the question, in terms of, you know, whether there is any evidence of actual learning going on in terms of the propaganda as it has, effective, as it has become more effective, according to what you said. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And so the final question for this round is by Paul, uh, and then we'll turn to participants. Uh, hi, so my question is uh, for Yulia. Um, you asked, uh, you mentioned how far can the EU go and um, said that the EU is concerned for rule of law and um, individual rights. Um, but I just wondered more, more generally about the limits uh, in terms of proportionality that there are in international law here. Are there some standards um, or measures um, that are applied by international lawyers to the limit the legality of the sanctions. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and uh, participants, now you have some time to respond and I will be watching for hands for the next round of Q&A. Uh, and maybe we can start uh, in the order of uh, the questions. Um, yes. Um... In response to the question with respect to my future research plans, I was thinking mostly to analyze the correlation between the sanctions design and how the sanction, sanctions design can to some extent impact the behavior of the Belarusian authorities. But at the same time, I think that it's very difficult to establish this link between uh, what sanctions can bring in terms of um, of the compliance by the Belarusian side, because in, in, in my opinion, we don't, um, it, it would be, um, we would not have enough data, for instance, to say that um, Belarusian authorities did that with this just because the European Union enacted sanctions. Um, we know that, of course, the uh, sanctions, they do play a role in, in the, um, with respect to political prisoners, and also in the past, uh, in my research, I noticed that some uh, uh, even uh, not very, very profound um, uh, 
substantial amendments, but still some, such, some, some amendments were done, for instance, to the Belarusian electoral laws. And it was mainly used as a way to, to show some, some compliance in order for the European Union then to, to lift uh, those rest restrictive measures. I think it, for, from this point of view, it would be extremely hard to, to establish this type of correlation. But I, I think maybe from, from the point of view of the sanctions design, it could be easier to uh, recommend maybe or analyze uh, some potential for EU restrictive measures to, uh, to influence the, uh, the behavior of the Belarusian authorities, for instance, by shaping uh, in a more coherent, uh, more realistic way, let's say, uh, the objectives of those restrictive measures. Uh, that's my answer to the first question. And then there was um, another question with respect to, to international law. Uh, from the point of view of international law, of course, I, we hear quite often the uh, Russian authorities, but also Belarusian authorities to claim that sanctions are unilateral measures which are not legal uh, under international law, but uh, from from the point of view of uh, legal scholarship on sanctions, there are different points of views, and uh, some would claim that uh, they are illegal, but some other scholars would claim that the sanctions are perfectly legal. They are uh, measures of the European Union toolbox, and those restrictive measures that are being uh, enacted by the European Union, they are 100% uh, uh, legal measures from, from the point of view of of the European Union. Then of course, how far can the European Union go in, in applying those restrictive measures? Of course, that's something which needs uh, an assessment and that's something which is uh, to some extent being done by, uh, there is this procedure which is called uh, legal impact assessment of restrictive measures uh, in order to understand, for instance, how this specific measure would uh, uh, impact the European business, how it could also affect the Belarusian citizens, uh, but from what was done by the European Union, I would actually question whether this assessment is uh, uh, well done or not, uh, specifically, for instance, when it comes to, to, the, to the ban of, uh, uh, of Belavia and uh, what I was mentioning in my uh, presentation as well, like to what extent it's really targeted and whether it really achieves, achieves its uh, uh, its its purpose, but then of course the legal assessment of EU restrictive measures it's done by uh, by by the Court of Justice. Um, I hope I answered your uh, your, your question, but if uh, not, if there are some uh, yeah, additional questions, I would be happy to answer. Uh, maybe we can go to Wasim now. Okay, in response to your question, um, I think I will contextualize the question like to my to my um, presentation and. I think um, your question leads me to think about the following question, like do authoritarian regimes learn from, from each other? And based solely on, on the data that I have, I, I don't think that, you know, Thailand and Belarus kind of, you know, learn from each other in terms of how to effectively manipulate um, um, nominally democratic um, institutions. However, I think this points to or the similarities of uh, manipulative practices um, point to the ways in which authoritarian regimes respond to like democracy. That is the um, accepted like um, political like principle. So I I think um, in order that authoritarian regimes will survive in like, you know, the world that democracy is kind of, you know, is a dominant and accepted form of, of political organization. Um, so they have to um, kind of play with democracy. And then um, this naturally leads to like, you no know, to the manipulation of democratic institutions in favor of um, the incumbent. Um, I, I hope this this answer your your question. Uh, thanks, Wasim and Ilya. Thank you very much for questions. Uh, it's about uh, if I will talk about effectiveness of propaganda. 
uh, it's it was it, it wasn't my main point of my presentation and my research recent but uh, i'm i was talking more about uh, some personal feelings uh, not that propaganda uh, has some uh, effectiveness of turning my point of view but that propaganda have very strong uh, connections with my connection with my emotions and it's it's placed with my emotions it's like a um, autobiography biographical study or so but it's it's obvious it's not uh, objective and uh, it's just my uh, personal attitudes and my personal feelings uh, from the other hand we have uh, uh, different objective measures so that uh, and uh, we can see that uh, audience of Jolte Slivy is uh, richer than in the first period of Belarusian revolution. Uh, it, uh, their, post, uh, have, uh, their posts uh, have much more um, views uh, right now uh, in comparing with the starting of this propaganda channel. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, from this point of view, yes, we can we can find some uh, some connections with uh, some object objective connections with, with um, effects of uh, Belarusian propaganda. Uh, especially so uh, uh, such very aggressive propaganda as uh, on the Jolte Sliva example. Mm. And the second question, can you please repeat because I don't think that I memorized it correctly. Absolutely. Um, it's just in terms of, you know, when the process began, Russian media, because lots of people in, Bel lots of people in Belarusian media left, the regime, Russian, yeah. Russian journalists came in. So I'm just wondering how much, I mean, in terms of learning has been taking place. If you say the Belarusian propaganda has become more effective than it was, how much has been copied from Russia? And, you know, to what extent? Uh, yes, uh, I think I'll, not not 100%, uh, but a lot of different methods uh, was copied from Russia. Uh, for example, as I said, uh, especially not from Russia, from Russian propaganda at all, but from Russia today, because uh, this uh, specialist was from Russia today mainly, uh, which came to Belarus. And uh, yes, some, uh, uh, for example, trying to divide uh, uh, Belarusian opposition, uh, trying to manipulate uh, with uh, opposition leaders, uh, trying to um, make some uh, conflict between oppositions, between uh, between opposition leaders is one of the pro priority of uh, today's propaganda. It's in, in, in some uh, way I can say that it is new method. It's more Russian style method because uh, previous Belarusian propaganda wasn't so sophisticated. It was very straightforward, very Soviet. And uh, this propaganda, uh, previous version of Belarusian propaganda, um, it's uh, not very much uh, wrote about opposition at all. And now, for example, if we are talking about Jolte Sliv, it's, uh, it's everything about opposition, but about opposition in the negative and very aggressive way. And it is also from the Russian style. Uh, another method of Russian propaganda is uh, trying to use more uh, sophisticated resources, intellectual resources. Uh, and uh, we can see that there are a lot of different TV shows on Belarusian television, intellectual TV shows like, uh, and uh, it, it's more like uh, these TV shows in, in Russia with Solovyov uh, or some other experts or so-called experts. And uh, in previous uh, uh, versions of Belarusian propaganda, there was not so much uh, intellectual trying to manipul manipulate uh, uh, with the intellectual point of view with the experts and so on. And now we will we can see a lot of experts, different experts from these uh, Belarusian sites, uh, from the uh, sites of Belarusian regime. So yes, I, I think a lot of different methods and. Uh, Many of them are obvious, and uh, a lot of them we need to understand more uh, deeply, and we need to analyze. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, and so now we can go to the uh, second round of Q&A. Uh, I'll start with Andrew Wilson. Uh, good, because my question was very similar to Stephen's. Um, he was asking about um, uh, copying the methods of Russian propaganda. Mine was much simpler about personnel. We know there was a kind of one-off influx of Russians in August 2020. But what ha what's happened since then? Are there still Russian kuratori or other links? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and the second question, please uh, take notes because I'll ask two more questions. So, um, Alona Nikolayenko, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I just uh, also have a question for Ilya about the position because I think you use uh, uh, this term a lot in your presentation. And I'm curious if you can uh, unpack it uh, a little bit, uh, and uh, in particular, since you're looking at the period between August and February 2022, uh, whether uh, the target of state propaganda uh, shifts uh, uh, over time uh, uh, from, let's say, Svetlana Tsikhanovska to Latushka or Bab Babarika, you know, do whom specifically uh, do they target uh, like specific individuals or how do they construct a position? Who is, the, who is their position in uh, contemporary Belarus right now? Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Uh, and um, finally, Vera Horton. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, what I wanted to ask you guys is what would be effective as a tool of counter propaganda? Because we, we need to create something. Do we have any historic recommendations on how can you counter propaganda? Because we, we tried already, we submitted the court case uh, into, the, into the Hague, into the International Criminal Court. We tried to go with jurisdictional um, procedures uh, with the German High Court uh, for crimes against humanity. But unfortunately, because those crimes get unpunished and there are no lawful assessment of what is done, we cannot go anywhere in the world and say, look, somewhere it is recognized as bad how in this situation we can create a counter propaganda just in case if you know thank you thank you and now um we can uh have uh responses by the participants um so please okay maybe, uh, I, I, I will yeah. try to answer uh first question is about russian uh Russian footprint of the some uh, some evidence of Russian footprint of Belarusian propaganda. Uh, I, I can say that uh, there is uh, some, for example, uh, there is a lot of different uh, um, citations of uh, Pridebaeva for this time. Not not very much uh, with comparison in uh 2020s but still this uh, this uh, hero of russian propaganda of russia today is it's still like a, but uh, now it's called like very very close friends of belarus in jolte sliver like a, but uh jolte sliver try uh, as a channel tries to divide uh, from from russia propaganda uh, they talk uh, more uh, about uh, some common media field but uh, Russia today uh, is a and pretty by a, like a hero of Russia today, like a person of Russia today, like a like a journalist of Russia today. It's uh, like allies, but not uh, not our uh, not our specialists. From the other hand, uh, I can say that uh, there is uh, the, there is very uh, strong pressure on Komsomolska Pravda in Belarus. Uh, and uh, Jolte Slivy, uh, if you are talking about Jolte Slivy, it, it, it is very interesting because uh, they have a sample of uh, of friends in Russian media, like Russia Today, and they have uh, some public enemies of Russian media, like uh, Komsomolska Pravda. So uh, there is no uh, th there is no common or uh, uh, 
there is no unity in pro-Russian discourse of Belarusian propaganda. There is some some points of view, and so there is some some agents. But uh, still, uh, Jolte Slivy tries to show themselves as uh, as Belarusian channel, a special Belarusian channel. Uh, about a question about uh, how propaganda constructs a position. This very, <clears throat> very interesting question, and I tried a lot to understand about it. Uh, if you are talking about such a channel as Zolte Slivy, uh, they target uh, more Tikhonovskaya, uh, not very much uh, target, uh, uh, they try to target Babarika uh, and uh, Latushka, mainly Tikhonovskaya. Tikhonovskaya from the point of view that uh, she betrayed uh, Belarusian people. She betrayed Belarusian opposition, uh, uh, and she is uh, like uh, so woman with uh, that which must be in the kitchen. But it's a very old pattern of uh, of propaganda in Belarus in, uh, from August. Uh, and, uh, but now I can say that. Uh, Jolte Sliver tries to show the image of opposition like uh, some very uh, underground group of people without leaders, because leaders, leaders betrayed the Russian opposition, without hope. Uh, and uh, justice will await everybody who uh, take part in, in the Belarusian protests and the, in the Belarusian uh, revolution. So uh, I can say that in some points of view, there is turn to previous uh, narrative uh, of, about Belarusian opposition uh, because uh, our political regime uh, every time tries to show that there is no uh, popular, uh, the opposition is not popular in Belarus. And this uh, connections with uh, like opposi opposition is Zmagari. It uh, shows that it is connection with previous uh, oppositional narrative uh, of Belarusian propaganda. Uh, and uh, it is not much more about political leaders. Leaders, it's much more about common people. Uh, if you read this uh, propaganda channel, uh, you will feel fear about, uh, for, for example, you will feel yourself insecure because a lot of different videos, uh, so-called pakayanne, uh, uh, like cleaning, <laughs> cleaning ritual of Belarusian propaganda. Uh, a lot of different uh, messages that show that Belarusian opposition, uh, there, there is no Belarusian opposition. There is uh, some some terrorists, some uh, uh, drugs, uh, drug dealers, and some alcoholics, but not Belarusian propaganda. From the one hand, if we are talking about uh, SB, uh, there is a much more intellectual way to talk about opposition, and there is. Uh, I will I will show for a second, if if it's possible, because uh, I haven't time to show all. Um, yep. Here, the last slide, we see that uh, opposition uh, has con uh, connection, discourse of opposition in uh, so, uh, SB has uh, connection with discourse of fascism uh, in, this, in this point, in the, in, in the point of betrayal. So Belarusian opposition uh, in the official uh, propaganda is uh, betrayals. From the one hand, and from the, from the other hand, there is some constructive opposition, like Gaidukevich, for example. Uh, so um, I, I think I uh, answer the question about different Im images of Belarus of Belarusian opposition. Uh, thanks, Elia. Uh, I want to give the floor to Yulia to see if she has uh, any responses to Vera and also uh, to Wasim after Yulia in case she has any any thoughts and additions. Um, as far as I remember the question, I think there is nothing from my presentations from from my field. But there was I, I I saw that there was one question: why procedures in international law are so slow? And it's also I think there's a general question of what do we do? Like what what are the strategies of influence uh, on Belarus if sanctions don't work, propaganda is effective, things like that? I think I, I would interpret it as a broad question. Sorry. Um, 
yeah, if the question is what 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 shall we do? I mean, I, I don't I don't have an answer to, to such a broad question. I can on, only I mean on the basis of my analysis. So maybe on sanctions, I could develop something if there is something more precise as well as a question. No, sorry, guys. The question was, in the situation when international law doesn't establish uh, Belarusian atrocity as wrongdoings, how can we establish a new reality by counter-propaganda? But in which way? Are there any recommendations? Any nations been in this situation? Maybe you know something from the history. That is the question. Thank you. Yeah, this is not really my field. Uh, it's a more related to propaganda. Unfortunately, I cannot answer to this question. Okay, I can try to answer the, the, this question. Uh, the... I just want to just highlight to Wasim in case he has any final thoughts after you because panel is coming to an end. So Wasim, if you have any, any further thoughts, reactions, um, comments, uh, you might have a chance to say them after Yeah, But if not, no problem. Please, sorry. Oh, okay, like to, to contribute to the conversation here, I think um, re recent literature in the field of polit um, political communication talks about authoritarian um, publics, and which means that we can research public spheres in authoritarian um, regimes. And I think one of the case studies is like, you know, is to um, analyze online political comments, which can be treated as um, like, you know, a communicative um, pattern in a particular public sphere. And in this um, public sphere, there are critical voices, although it's not um, an approach to counter um, uh, to counter the dominant na narrative articulated by the regime. But I think at least we can still see counter narratives like, you know, in the online um, public sphere. And maybe, um, so this, I, I think this is as much as I can go. I'm not sure if this can be um, thought of as a counter propaganda strategy, but at least I think we can like further research like um, counter narratives in, in the online public sphere in the authoritarian commu communicative um, settings. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sassim. And so, Ilya, final thoughts, two minutes. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that there is uh, one simple answer of this question, but uh, I see the main problem of the Belarusian independent me media right now. This problem is connected that uh, we sh uh, Belarusian uh, uh, media, uh, independent media, they uh, share one common agenda with uh, pro-government media. This is a very, very big problem because Lukashenko, like a, we, we saw is even jokes about it. Lukashenko, like a stand-up comic, he, he can produce a lot of different uh, strange uh, information, and stra uh, strange thoughts, uh, and so lots, of, uh, lots of misinformation, disinformation, lots of uh, very, very, very strange informational, uh, informational points. And our independent media, uh, writes about it every time. There is, it's, it's like a informational, uh, it's, it's like a informational wave of uh, disinformation, wave, wave of bad uh, information, information of very bad, bad quality. And uh, one of the methods, one of the strategy is not include uh, yourself in this propaganda agenda. And, and I see that it is very, very, um, it is, it is not easy to be always an independent media because if we uh, if we write uh, our po our channels like Zerkala uh, uh, formatted by it's uh, uh, fifty percent of uh, pro not pro but of this propaganda agenda in uh, about Ukraine about Ukrainian border about Ukrainian Ukrainian crisis. Uh, about Lukashenko's thoughts uh, of uh, of uh, Smolensk, for example, it's, and it's uh, on the hands of uh, of uh, our propaganda in Belarus. It is very big problem. We uh, haven't uh, positive narratives. We haven't uh, positive, uh, but maybe we have. But uh, we uh, more our independent media more focused on negative uh, pro propaganda agenda of uh, Belarusian regime. So it is a very big problem. 
Thank you very much. So we need to create a different machine of the positive information. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, now uh, in my role as a uh, chair of the panel i want to thank all three panelists uh and uh you know i learned a lot from these presentations thanks to the participants for active q a uh and i will uh, turn the floor to yarek for an important announcement about the annual lecture that is coming up uh at uh 5 p.m london time 17 o'clock yeah thank you very much for your also <clears throat> for your skillful uh, moderation and many thanks for very interesting presentations. <clears throat> the lecture uh, will take place in about uh, five minutes uh, and uh, we'll have a quick stretching break now. But I'm glad that we finished the first, well, the last panel on the need to have a positive agenda, to do something creative, not just to respond uh, uh, to what is happening you know, to all the narratives which the authorities are creating. So perhaps it's time to, to focus on our own culture, identity, development, rather than, you know, sanctions, repression. Of course, we, we, we can't be silent about these problems, but we need also to have a positive agenda. So thank you very much. I will see you in about five minutes uh, for the uh, keynote for the annual lecture.